Let me pause. Great. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, wherever you are, um, welcome to the Speak Truth to Power uh, Human Rights Defender Speaker Series and our conversation with our dear friend, Katerina Yushenko, um, and moderated by Carolyn Sauda from Bangor High School. Um, Katerina, we are so thankful to have you again on our speaker series. It was over a year ago that we had this session with you, um, and this year has been really horrible, um, but we appreciate you um, and the time you you spend with our teachers and our students to update them and really let us know what is happening in Ukraine today. My name is Karen Robinson. I'm the program director of human rights education at Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights. And our organization advocates for human rights issues um, and pursues strategic litigation to hold governments accountable both here and around the world our human rights education program uses uh, storytelling and interactive learning to provide the next generation with the concrete knowledge and skills they need to create change in this world. Um, and storytelling, narratives, Katerina, you've been a, a key source for that for us um, for over a year now. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm just so, it's such an honor to have you. And at this point, I'm gonna pass to our brilliant moderator in Bangor, Maine. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Katerina, for speaking with us today. And thank you to everyone who's watching. We're really excited to have this conversation. And as a note, if you have any questions during the um, interview, please post them in the comments section and we might be able to answer them if time permits. So. If everyone's ready to begin, I will start with the first question. So it has been a year since we last talked with you, Katerina. Uh, what are the biggest developments that have happened in Ukraine that you want to draw our attention to? Hello. First, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to meet with you all. Um, I want to give special thanks to Karen Robinson. Uh, my friend Carrie Kennedy, the FORFK team for the human rights team, for all they've done to help social justice and freedom in the US and abroad, and for all their efforts to help my country over the past year. Uh, I was supposed to speak to you a month ago and that was cut off because we had been bombed the day before and our internet was down. And that is what life is like here in Ukraine now. You know, the last time I spoke to you, it seems like it was a lifetime ago. And it makes me recall that I grew up with parents who had been teenagers during World War II. And I grew up hearing about their stories of German occupation of Ukraine, slave labor in Germany, the fact that they were refugees in the United States. And it always seems to be distant, a part of history rather than a part of my life. But now I have children who are teenagers and they are going through the same kind of invasion that my parents went through so many years ago. Uh, a war, another war has come to Ukraine and the Ukrainian nation has had to fight yet again. And I, like millions of other Ukrainians, am stunned by how quickly our lives changed. In a split second, our lives changed. It's now 393 days since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. But please remember that Ukraine has lived in a state of war for the past nine years. Since the Russians first occupied Crimea and then Donbass um, in 2014, when they tried to establish their colonial imperial empire, the empire that existed first under the Tsarists and then under, under the Soviet Union. Regarding the biggest developments, first, I think the important thing is that we withstood. You know, you may remember before the, the invasion in February, many predicted Ukraine would fall in three days. They said Ukraine is small, Russia is, has the second largest army in the world, and Ukraine doesn't stand a chance. But everyone underestimated us, and no one more than Putin himself uh, underestimated us. 
Um, he believed his own propaganda that Ukrainians might greet him with bread and salt and flowers and that his army was strong. They even, the, can you imagine the Russians uh, carried with them in their tanks, in their trucks, parade uniforms and medals to hand out after two or three days because they thought Ukraine would fall, that the president would leave, that they would have Kiev in a matter of days and that the West could do nothing about it. Um, but it turned out that the Russian military was a paper tiger and it was plagued by poor strategy, poor planning, uh, outdated and um, poorly maintained military equipment. Corruption had decayed the Russian uh, military capabilities and their soldiers were not trained. And indeed the morale of the Russian soldiers was very poor. And nobody expected the Ukrainians to fight back as they did. Tens of thousands of our citizens volunteered for the armed forces and territorial defense forces in the first few days of the war. They were joined by thousands more that returned from jobs abroad in Europe and the United States to fight in the war. And they came this way while millions of Ukrainians had to go, especially women and children, had to go the other way to avoid being killed in the war. And so the first point I want to make is that we beat back the Russians first in Kiev and then elsewhere during this year. But then they continued to try to invade and control other parts of Ukraine, bombing civilian infrastructure, schools, um, residences, hospitals. And they annihilated entire cities. You may have heard about Mariupol. It was a beautiful coastal city. Um, and they killed tens of thousands of people. And after they killed them, after they occupied the city, they tore down the buildings with the people in the buildings and used the rubble to create roads in Russia. And so people in Russia today are driving along roads that are carrying the bones of Ukrainian people. They, you know, the, we commemorated the one year anniversary yesterday or the day before of the bombing of the Mariupol theater where the people of Mariupol had hidden, several thousand people had hidden in there, and they had written outside children, Dieti in Russian, so that the Russians would know there are children inside. And the Russians deliberately targeted that building and killed hundreds of people in that building. They destroyed the entire city. They, the last holdout was the Azov steel plant. They, the soldiers there and the women and men lasted for days fighting until they were taken over. They were taken prisoner. And then their, the place where they were being held in Russia was bombed and they were killed. And there are still people we don't know what happened to them. I personally have a close friend whose husband was there the last day. She last heard from him in the mid-September and she has not heard from him since. And she and her two-year-old child are still waiting to, to find out if their father, their husband is alive. The Russians bombed Ukraine's second largest city, uh, Kharkiv, destroying countless buildings and even the nuclear research facility. Then they occupied the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which is the largest one in Europe. So we can say that this is now truly nuclear terrorism. It, but through the entire last year, we started recapturing, Ukraine started recapturing its territories. First in the Kiev area, you have all probably heard the words Bucha, Irpin, Borodyanka, cities that were so tiny that probably some Ukrainians had never heard of them. And yet now they become world renowned because they were centers of genocide. Then we took over Kharkiv, Kherson, and we found that in all the areas under Russian occupation, they had systematically committed war crimes. We found evidence of mass executions, filtration camps, where people were vetted, tortured, countless landmines, just thousands and tens of thousands of landmines left in people's homes, in churches, in schools. We also saw large scale sexual violence against men, women, children, even babies. And then we saw that in the areas that they had captured, there was forced indoctrination. Um, 
the first thing they did when they came in, they didn't take care of the people. They changed all the street signs into Russian. They removed Russian language from everything. They destroyed the textbooks. They told teachers that if you taught in Russian, you would be arrested. And they told parents that if you did not um, send your school, uh, your children to these ind- schools where they could be indoctrinated, your children might be taken away from you. So, and in this time, we found that just hundreds of thousands of people had been forcibly deported to Russia, including children, uh, orphans, children that had been under state care, children who had been taken away from their parents. Um, And they were illegally adopted. And they talked about that publicly in Russia, that we have taken these children and they are now living a good life. But we also saw that they were now taught not to love Ukraine, but to love Russia, to sing the anthem, to, to learn how to shoot. You know, they, I have to tell you that they even attacked zoos, animal shelters, stables, 6 million animals, domestic animals were killed, um, 50,000 dolphins in the Black Sea were killed during this war. You know, the environmental effects on Ukraine are yet to be counted. You know, they blocked our ports, um, they halted grain exports to low income nations in Africa and the Middle East. Um, They caused skyrocketing global food prices, and they put millions of people outside of Ukraine into the threat of starvation. You know, Ukraine, I want to remind you, was a breadbasket of Europe, and we feed about 400 million people in the world. And so Putin used our grain to weaponize food and to gain leverage and try to get Uh, many of these countries to oppose Ukraine because they were now not getting their food. And we're very grateful that the UN and Turkey and other companies stood up and brokered a deal to get some of the food out. Um, I just want to say a few more things about what has happened in this year. Um, Russia held a sham referendum in September where they um, supposedly asked the people, but it was all under gunpoint. And then Putin ceremoniously signed the accession of parts of Ukraine um, to Russia, including, which was amounts to about 15% of our country. But we ha- were able to take some of those areas back. We've now taken back about 50%. Um, and it was a humiliating defeat for Russia. The last thing I want to say that what they did is starting in October, they started systematically bombing all our energy plants in Ukraine. And trying to make, uh, they felt that if Ukrainians were cold, um, they may rise up against their government, which just, which was just the opposite. The more they bombed us, the more we so we supported the the the, the fight against their domination. Um, when they didn't have, when they started realizing that spending almost a billion dollars in um, uh, missiles on Ukraine was expensive, they started buying cheaper uh, drones from Iran and started targeting Ukrainian energy plants, but often they missed the energy plants and hit residences. Um, And they've killed many civilians. Even yesterday, they killed people, um, about a dozen people in south of Kiev and people in Zaporizhia trying to target the energy plants. So to sum up, you know, we pray right now a year into the war, a year and a month into the war, that the equipment we received, um, our continued will to fight, um, will lead us to win the war this year, and that Russia will retreat and be brought to justice. Thank you for that. You, th- that was very devastating to hear all of those different developments, but it does give me a bit of hope that Ukraine has stayed so strong. Can you speak to how like an average Ukrainian citizen has reacted to all this devastation and how, you know, what does it take for them to be so resilient? Thank you. You know, we have stayed strong because we have to stay strong. You know, as they say, if Russia stops fighting, there'll be no war. If Ukraine stops fighting, there'll be no Ukraine. And You know, I think that the strength and the resilience that a lot of people have noticed about our people, you know, many people didn't understand that Ukraine was even a nation or that there were Ukrainian people. And over the last year, people have seen truly a sense of resilience 
that uh, that has become um, legendary in some ways. You know, it comes from our history. The fact that for centuries we have been fighting for our independence and our freedom. We've been struggling to protect our language and our culture from destruction. And indeed, we have had many cases where Russia has tried to kill us, to commit genocide. And so we, this has given us strength because we have lived through this again and again in the past. And then it, uh, the strength also comes from our national spirit. Uh, we often say that freedom is our religion and that in this way, we are very different from Russian society where people are willing to take a higher power, a, a tyrannical government rather than freedom. We will not do that. We have a vibrant, vibrant civil society. We have a vibrant media. Uh, we hold elections. And if we see that they're not um, fair, we call it out, we fight it. That's why we've had several revolutions in the last 20, 30 years. Um, we volunteer, we create, we form NGOs, we form communities, we fight for European values, probably even more than Europe itself. You know, in the first few days of war, Ukrainians from all four walks of life joined the, the army and the territorial defense, and they were rock stars and ballerinas and Olympic stars, college students, IT people, nurses, and everybody came together. Village women stopped tanks just stood up and stopped tanks. Kievites made Molotov cocktails. Soldiers blew themselves up cross, uh, be, and not allowing the Russians to cross bridges. You know, people in the occupied areas risked their lives to protest. That gives us strength. The fact that our people are willing to risk their lives in, in the most difficult situations, that gives us all strength. And, you know, I have to say that we even surprised ourselves ourselves when it came to the resilience of our system. Ukrainians more than anyone complained about our government, our, our banks, our stores, everything. We, we, we like to complain, but we found when the war started that the banking system continued, the ATMs all worked. You can transfer through mobile banking money to your children in a matter of a minute. The local governments worked. We had a decentralization, which Russia would never allow. So our mayors, our local government officials could take, could do, could take um, responsibility in situations which kept us going through the war. Uh, local businesses continued to operate. Farmers continued to plant and sow, even though um, there most of the a lot of their areas were mined. Thirty percent of our country is mined. If you think that's the size of Two, two Austrias, for example, it's a huge part of our country is mined and yet the farmers continue to grow. And all our supermarkets, I, I've been surprised that whenever I go into a supermarket, we have almost everything there. And I think that is that gives us strength to know that the system still works. We're resilient because we truly are buoyed by the uh, support of people around the world. You know, we have seen people protesting, we have seen people gathering funds, we have seen artists, rock groups, students, government leaders, churches, all trying to support Ukraine. And every time we see that, there's that little note on Twitter or something at night or on the news that we see and we say, oh, if they're supporting us, we can keep going on. And then I'd say that the final thing that keeps us strong is that we have a strong commitment to a better future. You know, uh, our future, we believe, is in Europe and not in the Russian sort of feudal system of, of dictatorship. Um, and, but to get that, but to get that kind of future, we need our whole country back because we know that if we give up parts of our country, we'll never get the investments that we need to build the future we need for our children. Um, that it will only put off a future invasion of a few years into the future. And we have decided that we're not going to leave this for our children, for our grandchildren. You know, we don't want war. We want peace, but we don't want to be slaves. And um, we want peace, but not at any price. And so we're confident that we're going to win. 93% of people just polled this week said that they're absolutely sure Ukraine will win. 
And we feel that if Ukrainians are willing to give up everything for their dignity, for their freedom, for their identity, victory is our only option. I definitely echo the sentiment that the Ukrainian people have really demonstrated an amazing resistance and effort, and it is inspiring around the world. Um, and so I think this is a good time to bring up the New York Times reported 60,000 women have joined the Ukrainian armed forces since the war began last year. Can you speak to the role of women in this resistance effort and you know, what? what is their role like? Thank you. Thank you. It's It's been truly inspiring to see. I have to tell you that Ukrainian women have always played a role throughout our history. And in times of war, over centuries, Ukrainian women always uh, took responsibility for households, cities. They, unlike many other countries in Europe, Ukrainian women always had the right of inheritance, of, um, of leadership. And so the role of Ukrainian women has always been different in our part of the world than it was in much of Europe. You know, currently, Ukrainian women make up about 15% of our armed forces, uh, which is higher than many other countries. You know, there are about 50,000 women currently serving in the Ukrainian army in combat and non-combat uh, positions. 10,000 Ukrainian women are currently on the front or in positions that could bring them to the front lines of the war. Um, there were about 32,000 women before the February 23 escalation, uh, yes, February 23 escalation of the war. So it went up from 32,000 to 50,000 women. And many women joined the territorial defense forces in the first few weeks, including our eldest daughter, who immediately signed up and um, who had never probably held, <laughs> to my knowledge, a, a gun in her life. And she was taught to shoot and she was protecting a certain uh, road in the city. And that was in the first few days. And she represents the, the thousands of women who, who went out of their way to really, to, to really protect the country in the first few days. Um, but I wanna say that, that women have played a much bigger role than just in, in the army. You know, there are many active, I, I have to say that the best spokesmen in the Ukrainian parliament that go abroad and speak eloquently in English and talk about Ukraine are all women. And uh, even though we don't have enough women in government, in my opinion, I think that the ones we do have that are in ministries and others are truly the best that Ukraine can present. Uh, we've had many Ukrainian women volunteers, and that's from, 19, from 2014 on. The women led the effort to support the Ukrainian army, whether it was cooking, whether it was knitting, or whether it was organizing, fundraising for millions of dollars to go to, to help our soldiers and our efforts, to women taking in children and helping the children of our fallen soldiers. And women were tremendous volunteers and they then created NGOs. For example, there was a woman who created an NGO that, um, that documented all the war crimes that started um, happening in Ukraine from, from 2014 on. And she won the Nobel Peace Prize last year for her efforts. And she is a rather young woman, I think in her thirties, who has been very effective. Um, there, as you may know, most of the millions, up to 12 million uh, Ukrainians went abroad as refugees. Most of them were women with children and old people. And these women had to go to Poland, France, Germany, England. They had to go abroad, find jobs, support their families. They, the men were forced to stay behind. And these women have done an incredible job. Um, I traveled and met with many of them in Poland and Carrie Kennedy was with me where these women talked about, um, talked about what they've had to do. Their first question is always, where can I get a job? Their second question is, where can I put my children into schools? And the third question is, when can I go home? 
And these women have been incredibly, incredibly strong. And more than half of them have now returned because they want to be with their families. They want to help rebuild Ukraine. There's been talking about women, that there's one thing I cannot not talk about. And that's the fact that one of the main weapons of war that the Russians have used um, in this war has been sexual violence. When they came in, there was massive rape in all the cities where they were that were occupied, and it was rape of women, men, children, even infants. And they tried to use rape as a weapon of war. It was encouraged, and we even taped phone conversations of, of families encouraging the rape of Ukrainian women. So this is an issue that still needs to be discussed. And I think it will be one of the issues that will come up in the war crimes trials in the near future. And just as a follow-up question to that, um, there's a question in the chat that says, do you think that more female representation in government after the war is pivotal, is pivotal um, for resolving this kind of conflict? Absolutely. I want to say that women, uh, the women have really, I, first I have to say, when I came to Ukraine from the United States, I was shocked by the role of women in Ukraine. Uh, it was, they were very intelligent and, and they worked in very important positions in banks and, and hospitals and schools, but they never rose up to high positions. When I talked in the 90s and the 2000s about women being in government, people slightly laughed at me. Now women have started taking more and more responsibility and people have seen that where they are, there is effectiveness, there is efficiency, and frankly, there's less corruption. So I, I, though I don't think that Ukrainian women have reached all the roles they should they should have by this point, I think they will, because they have truly proven themselves. And so I have no doubt that in the future, not only will uh, women prove themselves, but men will understand that the government and both at the national level and at the municipal levels will be much better off with them. Can you please talk about women as business leaders in Ukraine? Well, do you know, um, there are many uh, women-owned businesses in Ukraine. And I have to say that in the last, um, just in the last year, I have seen many, many more, particularly strangely for me as an older person, I've seen so much of it on Instagram as women have started creating home businesses. And this is, I think, has come from um, after uh, post-COVID and now the war. A lot of places, a lot of people can't afford to open up a shop or, or a catering or something in the center of Kiev. And so instead, we now see on Instagram someone, dozens of people making candles, which have been important during our energy crisis, um, making clothes, uh, catering, and so on. So I think women are starting to come into their own. And frankly, I started, this your question made me think about how this will truly um, grow even more when the men come back because women have had to support their families as their husbands have been in war. And more and more women have thought about how can I support families? And interestingly enough, a lot of these women who have been in Poland, Germany, the United States, Canada, will come back with ideas. You know, I saw this particular um, shop, this particular restaurant, this particular cafe, this particular business abroad that doesn't exist in Ukraine. And I think what we're going to see is women taking a much greater role, as, as many countries of the world, in opening up the small and medium-sized businesses in Ukraine. My dream is that they're also put much more into the, the big businesses of Ukraine. Thank you for that perspective. 
So now I want to move on towards like the international stage and how this conflict fits in international politics. So what have you noticed about how other countries have responded to this conflict and what kind of responses are helping the situation and which ones aren't helping? You know, I have to say that Ukrainians are truly grateful for the international coalition um, of democratic nations who have come together to provide us with support. Uh, and this support has given us strength and hope to carry on. You know, first and foremost, the fact that so many countries like Poland and so many others have taken our refugees, it was instantaneous. Can you imagine tens of thousands were crossing the border every day? And yet Poland incorporated these people instantaneously and not in refugee camps that we see existing in Palestine and in so many areas of the world. Within two or three days, all of these millions of people, uh, thousands of people a day, millions of people over two months were in people's homes. Oh, and that is something that has been truly remarkable. I. I understand that some people um, have been hurt by the fact that Ukrainians were accepted so instantaneously. I think first and foremost is because they were women and children, because they went to their neighbors. But I also think it's an example for everyone else when Europe could not incorporate a few thousand Serbi uh, excuse me, Syrians in the matter of, uh, of months. They should take an example from the Poles and others who were able to incorporate so many Ukrainians into their society and not just give them a place to live, but create schools, create um, job opportunities for them to make them uh, immediately give them the support they need, the opportunity to go back if they wanted to go back. As I mentioned, Kerry Kennedy and I traveled there, talked to these people, and it was truly amazing. None of them. Not one person we talked to complained about um, how they were received, just the opposite. Some of them said that we were scared to come to the, to the West because we were told by the Russians that our children would be taken away, that we'd be going into sexual slavery, that our passports would be taken away. And it's just the opposite. We have seen opportunities. And uh, you know the, they've gotten opportunities to, to educate their children. We recently visited, my husband and I, Oxford and um, Cambridge that have opened up opportunities for Ukrainian students to study. These people are going to come back and change Ukraine. So first, I'd like to say we're thankful for how our refugees were accepted. Secondly, we're thankful to the U.S., the U.K., and many Europeans for the arms they've provided because it's given us the hope that we can maintain our freedom. Uh, we wish we'd gotten them sooner. We've been asking for them for years. Have we gotten them sooner? This before would never have happened. If we had gotten NATO membership, this war would never have happened. You know, we're, we, but I'm going to say we're still need more. We need missile defense we, to keep, to somehow protect us from the bombs raining down in our cities. We need military equipment so we can regain our land. We're grateful to the Western nations have, who have imposed sanctions on, um, on Russia. And the world must continue to make it very expensive for Russia to continue this war. One billion dollars a day comes into the pockets of the Russians to finance this war every day from the oil and gas that's being bought by Europeans and others and that and Indians and Chinese, and that has to stop. And Russia has to be declared a state um, sponsor of terrorism. You know, we're grateful for the financial support. Our country has suffered tremendously by the Russian attacks. Uh, we are suffering a three to five billion dollar deficit every month. Um, our, our economy will shrink uh, by a third to a half last year and this year. You know, they've uprooted people from their homes. Farmers have been found hard to plant. Businesses have not run. Um, Access to our ports have been blocked. Uh, we've had to raise defense spending. And with every day that the war continues, the cost of rebuilding is up. So we 
truly appreciate the multinational organizations and the countries that have given us financial support. Um, and we're grateful for the massive protests that have been held around the world, the students, the people have gotten together in Paris, in Berlin, in London, in New York to help us with humanitarian support that they've gathered all the amazing, amazing artists and um, actors and singers who have come together and supported Ukraine. It has been every day when we see a new Hollywood actor coming up and saying we're support Ukraine it gives us hope and it gives our soldiers the ability to, to fight you know, churches around the world to come together to provide us with humanitarian aid. Um, we're grateful to see that countries that originally were not supporting us, such as Germany, you know, Germany in the first day said, the most we can do is give them 50,000 helmets. Now they're giving us tanks and support and we truly appreciate it. And the 30 countries that have come together to, to, to demand a tribunal for the crime of aggression against Putin and his, and his cronies, uh, we're grateful to them. But, you know, I have to also say that there are many countries that have disappointed us, including our neighbors, Hungary and Serbia, that have been, um, I have to say, bought by Russia. Uh, we have seen many politicians in Europe, Germany, Switzerland, and others that have been bought by Putin. You know, we see countries like Switzerland and Dubai allowing oligarchs to keep their money there and to keep companies continue to work there and somehow avoid sanctions. We're very disappointed in this. We're disappointed in um, the reaction of people in the global south, people in Africa, the Middle East, Asia, Latin America, who do not understand that we are fighting a war against imperialism and colonialism just as they did. And that they should support us in the same way that Russia is the same kind of colonial power and imperial power that they fought against when they were fighting against England and, and France and Belgium and, and all that. We're disappointed in Iran for selling drones. We're disappointed in China for, for giving Putin his, his joy two days ago that he finally got one foreign visit. Um, and we're disappointed in countries like France, in, in left and right-wing parties in the United States, um, in think tanks and people in the multinational community who talk about the need for a ceasefire for so-called peace in Ukraine. We saw what peace brought Ukraine. The, the areas that had been occupied by, um, by Russia, we came in, people there were murdered, deported, raped, indoctrinated, you know, and we saw the, the joy of people when we liberated them. So the only, the only entity that needs a ceasefire now is Russia because the morale is low, they've suffered humiliating defeats, they've lost men and equipment, the sanctions are hurting them tremendously. Hundreds of thousands of their best people have fled the country. They need a break. They need to regroup again so that they can attack us. And so when people say that we should, um, and leaders say, are pressuring us to um, negotiate, to give a ceasefire, to give up our land, they're asking us to accept a partial uh, genocide and that we will accept that our children, grandchildren will be attacked in the future. And, you know, we've tried to negotiate for decades. We abandoned our NATO membership uh, aspirations. We signed legally binding treaties, but they attacked us anyway. So, and they will not stop until they destroy us. They've used nuclear blackmail. Um, and a lot of countries are falling for that, which is very sad because it sets a dangerous precedent. It makes a war in the future more likely. It will encourage nuclear proliferation um, because it shows that having nuclear weapons and threatening to use them works. We're grateful to all the nations. Um, I think it was 141 nations that uh, supported us in the UN resolution asking for uh, Russia to withdraw. 
And so, you know, we feel that the world is supporting us. And, you know, I think it's important to understand that the world, that we're fighting not just for Ukraine, we're fighting for Europe, we're fighting for civilization values, for a world based on laws and human rights, and that we're countries that care about those things should support us now. It is actually a relief to hear you say that Ukraine is very grateful to all the countries who are standing in support. Um, I think it does get very overwhelming for individuals who feel kind of helpless in this situation. What would you say to an individual who does support Ukraine but doesn't feel like they have any power, you know, to do anything? You know, I think that what we've seen with the rise of social media recently is that every individual matters. You know, whether it's giving voice, whether it's writing an article, whether it's contributing. You know, in the past, I felt if I contributed a little, it meant nothing. But now with crowdfunding, when you contribute a little and tens of thousands of other people also contribute a little, it amounts to a lot. And so I think that what we're seeing is that there's so much that can be done by, by individuals. You know, um, we have seen when individuals come together in protests, in writing, um, speaking out, um, it, it really matters a lot. And I have to say what an individual in the United States can do is vote because we've seen a lot of uh, polarization in the United States. And I think it's very important for young people who tend not to vote as much as they should. And um, I think that um, that has been natural over the decades, but it's something that has to change. Young people have to vote. Um, I ask that individuals boycott companies that continue to support uh, Russia. For example, um, you know, we saw how supporting um, sanctions against South Africa helped down, helped destroy apartheid. We would like to see the same with Russia companies. There's a recently a company that was um, shown uh, in California to be exporting parts that were used in the military of Russia to make their weapons more accurate companies have to be boycotted. Um, there's a lot individual, you know, the, the every Ukrainian family that went abroad was hosted by individuals, by someone. I, I brought two young girls to Paris. They were, they were accepted by a family that had one extra bedroom. And they've now been there for over a year and the family asked them to stay until they finished high school. You know, these are the kinds of, uh, of sort of examples of personal generosity that make a tremendous difference because I know those two young women, they, they are granddaughters of my good friend, are going to come back and build a big Ukraine. And so that was an individual uh, example. And, you know, I ask you all as individuals to study Ukraine, to understand what's happening, to be able to respond to disinformation that comes out so often. And when I say that, I mean, not just Ukraine, there's so many examples in the world where there's disinformation. It's important to get an education and to understand what's going on. And what I have seen that has amazed me most is how individual Ukrainians have used their talents. And not everybody can go to the front, but somebody can knit, somebody can draw, somebody can paint, somebody can sing. And that's what I ask you to do when it comes to something that's your passion. Um, if you paint, if you take photographs, if you write, use your passion to pursue your, um, your values and your morals. And it will give you greater satisfaction in life than just pursuing um, a better house or a bigger salary. That's really inspiring. Thank you. Um, so recent news has shown that the International Criminal Court had issued a warrant for Putin's arrest. Can you give your opinion on that? Um, I believe that that is extremely important. Um, you know, when it, independent judges came together 
and decided to um, that Putin had committed a crime, and it was one of many crimes that he had committed. And they came together to, um, it, it was important symbolically. It was, it scared him to death. There are many countries in the world he cannot visit now. And I think that's important. He is supposed to visit um, South Africa in the future. And South Africa has already said that they will not be able to uh, guarantee that they won't arrest him. He cannot visit one of his favorite countries that has always been one of his, the countries that has supported him most, Germany. I think it's also important that um, people around him see that there is no impunity, that they might also be held. And then, so thus there is a deterrence effect of, um, of this decision that others may be careful in committing war crimes, um, in committing genocide. And, but I want to say that this is not, um, this is not, all we want. We want many other war crimes to be tried. And we want a special tribunal for the crime of aggression. And that is a, something that is not, um, that is not um, tried by the International Criminal Court and that can try the leadership of Russia for actually ordering the war. And 30 countries of the world have now called for the special tribunal. And it's very important to us that Putin stays alive and that he is tried for this. And people like Shoigu, his defense minister and others are there on the trial, with the trials. We very strongly feel that Russia has to be judged and the Russian nation has to be judged the way Germany was after World War II. So as we're coming to the last 15 minutes of our conversation, uh, what, what do you think resolution to this conflict and healing from this conflict looks like? And what do you hope to see in the future? Well, you know, I, you know, I hope that, um, you know, we get hope and understanding. And, Ukrainians get hope and understanding from the fact that people around the world, for the first time in our entire history, understand what we have been going through and understand Ukraine's needs, understand our struggle for freedom and independence. And for centuries, we have fought the same fight against Russian imperialism and no one understood. You know, um, and that gives me a great deal of hope. I get a great deal of hope from um, the resilience of my fellow Ukrainians. You know, what I would like to see in terms of the um, a resolution, you know, all and here I want to say Ukrainians are unanimous in how they see the resolution to our conflict. Um, for the first time in our history, we are not divided in, in many different ways. We have a single vision. And that's a vision that we want all the troops out of Ukraine. We want a return to our 1991 borders, which were recognized internationally and which were recognized in various treaties by the Russian Federation. And we feel that we have to get back to those borders. Um, we want all our POWs and all our deported people, especially our children returned to us that have been moved into Russian families. We want reparations for the tremendous destruction of our country, which um, I think has amounted to almost a trillion dollars of destruction. And we feel that much of that can be compensated by um, confiscated Russian assets, that the Russians should have to pay for that, not just our European friends and American friends and allies. Um, we want justice. As we just said, you know, the world must hold Russia accountable. And it's imperative that there be international tribunals for the crime of aggression, for war crimes, for genocide. But, you know, even when we gain our back our territories, and as I mentioned, 93% of Ukrainians are confident we will, even when we gain back our territories, um, we feel that it's, that's not the end, because Russia will continue to be an aggressor state and will continue to be a threat, not just to us, but to our neighbors, the Baltic countries, Poland, Europe, 
And that's why it's very important that Russia go through a process very similar to um, what Germany went through after World War II, where they are forced to um, give up their war aims, where they are forced to become democratic, where their people are taught what democracy means, what, what they have done. And that th this, is, this is very important that um, we reach that place where not only Ukraine is free, but that the world is free from Russian aggression. And, you know, I look forward to the day when um, we all work together to rebuild Ukraine. And I think that many of the people listening today um, are going to be a part of that process. We see our rebuilding, not just in building again our buildings, but in creating a new educational system, a new health system in our country, um, in digitalizing our economy, in uh, making agriculture more effective so we can feed more of the world by using real I, new IT technologies for agriculture. Um, by and we look forward to the day when many people come to our cities to see our to see our cities, our nature, our museums, our people, our culture, um, our traditions. But in this process, we think this will provide tremendous opportunities for everyone in terms of um, you know profits of bringing in companies, supporting small, medium, and large businesses, and rebuilding what we hope will be a Ukrainian miracle which is very similar to what we saw in terms of the Asian miracles over the last few decades. Wow, that is a good vision to have. And I hope that Ukraine can stay strong and get done with this conflict very soon. Um, there's a student question. Do you think the forces allied with both Ukraine and Russia understand the possibility that this could be a world war? I personally already think it is a world war, but maybe more like a global armed conflict? That's an excellent question. You know, I think that when somebody like one of your candidates for president called it a regional conflict, they were wrong, very, very wrong, because I believe what's happening in Ukraine is a threat to not just our neighbors and all of Europe, but to the United States. We are seeing, um, after, it, I am old enough to remember when there was a bipolar world where the United States was spending trillions of dollars to try to prevent, to try to promote freedom, democracy and prevent a threat. And I believe that the threat is coming back and we're seeing authoritarians of the world uniting um, against the idea of civilizational values, of democracy, freedom, you know, Russia invaded Ukraine because of the tremendous threat that democracy, freedom, and you could say civil society fighting corruption posed to Russia. That is a threat that many authoritarians and dictators in the world fear. And so I, I strongly believe that this has become a war of civilizational values against um, a dictatorship, that not everybody understands that because they would rather um, go on with other things in their lives, but there are certain things you can't ignore. And the fact that if the US and Europe and the global South and others don't um, stand up to this now, this war could reach them. Um, this war could reach them militarily. This war could reach them in terms of the environmental destruction. If Russia takes more of Ukraine, it could reach them in terms of, of thousands or millions more refugees. And if Ukraine loses and Russia decides it will move into Poland or the Baltic countries or Georgia or Romania, it could also lead to NATO becoming involved. And if NATO becomes involved, that will be a world war. And that's why it's so important for Ukrainians who are fighting and dying to get the support we need to actually end this here. Thank you. So that's all the questions I have. If anyone in the chat has anyone 
has any more questions, I can ask them now or we can wrap up. Seems like no one else has a question. So thank you so much for speaking with us. This was a very insightful conversation. Um, I think we've all learned a lot and thank you, Karen, for helping with this conversation and thank you for all who tuned in. Um, if you would like additional educational material materials about Katerina and the war in Ukraine, please visit Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Speak Truth to Power website. And if you enjoyed this event, let us know by sharing it with your friends and followers and connections on RFK's Human Rights Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, Twitter, or YouTube, so that you can be one of the first people to learn about next events that are coming up in this series. So thank you. And I believe Carrie Kennedy is going to say something. I, but before Carrie speaks, I just want to thank Carrie and Karen and you, Caroline, for, for this opportunity to highlight Ukraine. I think that the U.S. is so often, um, uh, the media and others isolate you from some of the news. So I truly appreciate this opportunity and all you're doing for, for human rights and democracy in the world. Thank you. I know, I know Carrie's preparing for another, but I brought her in just in case, because I know how much um, she is invested in this work and invested in you. And I just want to add my thanks. Um, and thank you to Caroline and Bangor High School for being an outstanding whole school partner. We love you all very much. And, and thank you. And thank Adam and Katerina. Um, yeah, we're forever with you and in your corner and, and, and with the people of Ukraine. So with much appreciation for your time and, and continued education uh, for us in our network. So, and I think Carrie may be already preparing for her next event, but. <laughs> okay, I hope Karen, we don't have to meet a year from now because the war will be over. And by then a lot of the people listening to us will be already traveling to Ukraine and trying our wonderful food and uh, meeting our people and seeing our sites. It's, it's on my calendar the second we can, but yeah, we'll, that's what we're all working for. So thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Um, have a good afternoon, a good evening. Take good care. Be safe. Thank you.